And so Ezra would have read and preached on this occasion. A little bit of support is found in Nehemiah 8, verse 13. On the second day, the chief of the fathers, the priests, and the Levites came and were gathered unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. So they came to Ezra on day two to understand the law, which not only includes the reading, but also the preaching of the scripture. So we've looked at the venue and the pulpit and Ezra with the support of these 13 Levites. One more item is needed. The book. The book of the law mentioned at the start of Nehemiah 8. Probably this was a particularly fine copy of Moses' five books. This was a copy which had been preserved, well preserved, despite the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians, and despite the 70 years captivity in Babylon. This book of the law was opened and read. And since it was a scroll, it was rolled out and kept out, perhaps with some of the Levites holding it at the end. And Ezra would, with his eye or finger, read down the text to the people from the raised platform. <coughs> we should also notice the time slot spoke about this this morning, but I want to build on it now. Verse 3 says that this went on from morning until midday. That is, from 6 o'clock in the morning to noon. About 6 hours. Now we need to think about it. 6 hours. That's a long session by anyone's reckoning. That's an early start you're going to be there for preaching and reading of the scriptures from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you obviously need to get up before 6 o'clock. This is going to involve, too, people traveling to Jerusalem and traveling to Jerusalem in the darkness to get there, or at least having taken lodgings in Jerusalem the night before. These are people who are keen because they're obedient to the laws about this special feast, and they're thankful that God has raised up the altar which speaks of Jesus Christ in the midst of the church. This raises, of course, the obvious question, are you willing to endure some hardship for Christ's sake? Are you willing, in this instance, to endure some hardship for the word? In order to hear <coughs> preaching, in order to hear expository preaching, or are you saying, you know, I wouldn't even go to the end of the road to hear preaching. I only come because Daddy tells me to come. You see, when I'm a bit older, you'll not see me knocking on the door. These people, God's Spirit was in them. They were willing to make sacrifices to hear expository preaching and to ask for it. Because they were obedient, and they were thankful. And when you're thankful or grateful, you're willing to put yourself out, and you're willing to get your priorities straight and seek first that kingdom, which unlike every other kingdom, will last forever. And now we need to look at the methods of Ezra's expository preaching. First of all, we have the elements the elements of the liturgy of the word which Ezra himself included, the elements which those who followed him used, including the Levites and indeed the elements that all before and all after have used. Verse 8 says, So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. The first part, or half of the verse, deals with the reading of the word. So they read in the book and the law of the Lord distinctly. That's the reading. 
The second half has to deal with the preaching of the word and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So verse 8 speaks of the reading and the explanation or exposition and preaching of the word. So we say, to state the obvious in case it's missed, not just one without the other. The minister doesn't come to church, to put it in 21st century terms, and he reads, but he doesn't preach. That's not what happens. The minister doesn't preach without reading the word. Both of them together. Calvin in his liturgy or order of worship in Geneva called that part of the church service the word. By the word he meant the first part, the reading, and the preaching of the word because both for him were essentially one. The word read and preached is one word of God. The order is important here too. It doesn't have the explanation or preaching of the word first, <coughs> then the reading. It has the reading and then the exposition. And you say, well, that's very obvious. Of course it is. You read the scriptures, you have it before you, then you explain it. That's the way we do it here. And that's the way just about everybody does it. So what about the reading then? What did Ezra and what did these Levites read? The book of the law. The Pentateuch. The first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Alexander Scurby's narration of the Bible in the authorized version, English, gives nine and three quarter tapes to the Pentateuch. I checked my collection today. Nine and three quarter tapes, right? If each tape is about 90 minutes, then, I'll work this out too, it would be 877 minutes or so, which would be over 14 and a half hours. So in English, if you were to read the Bible at scurvy speed, 14 and a half hours. Now, Nehemiah 8 speaks of the scriptures being worked with for six hours. So even if the person had read really, really quickly, and even if you can read Hebrew more quickly than English, there's no way you could pack 14 and a half hours our way into six hours. So they didn't read all the Pentateuch. That's our conclusion. But the text doesn't say they read all the book of the law. The text actually says, verse 3, that Ezra read therein. He read in the law, not all of it. Verse 8 has it, they read in the book, in the law of God distinctly. Which leads us to this conclusion, they read excerpts, portions, bits, parts of it. And they probably read the key parts, the central passages, the main ones, Genesis 17 perhaps was in there, Genesis 1, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, the crossing of the Red Sea, those sorts of fundamental passages and many others. So they're reading in the Pentateuch, excerpts. This raises the question, what sort of stuff is in the Pentateuch? What's found there? Well, you all know, I'm sure you do, I'll point it out for you. There are historical narratives there. The vast majority of Genesis, history, stories in the past, the first half of Exodus, some of Numbers, for example, the material which we cover with the children in the various Old Testament catechism classes, Old Testament history, the material that Homer Hooksema covers in his Unfolding Covenant History, the first few volumes. We also have laws there in the Pentateuch. They're harder going. Some of Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and almost all of Leviticus. 